from the biocentric point of view, uh, at least as I see it, quantum mechanics is not uh, mechanics about an objectively existing external observer independent world. Quantum mechanics is a mechanics of consciousness and the world associated with it are inseparable whole. Everybody and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. So today we have the extraordinary theory of biocentrism to consider. It's the hypothesis that the universe arose from life and not the other way around. Now this theory is obviously flying completely in the face of material science's Darwinian view that life and consciousness evolved slowly out of ever more complex systems of matter. Now, we have heard in multiple interviews on the show so far that similar theories like panpsychism, the hypothesis that consciousness is fundamental to the physical world, are hugely increasing in popularity, and not only among philosophers, but also among physicists. I think perhaps because so many of the anomalies coming out of quantum physics can be explained in a panpsychist model. But this is the first time, as far as I know, that a scientist has argued that life itself is fundamental to the physical world. Now, perhaps to many of scientists out there, this will sound absurd. But as the theory has been popularized by the award-winning stem cell biologist Robert Lancer, it seems important that we at least give it a closer look. Um, now, given our physics slant on chasing consciousness, we are extremely lucky today to be speaking with Robert Lancer's co-author on the new book about the theory, the grand biocentric design, how life creates reality, the physicist and author Matej Pausic. Dr. Matej Pausic has been a theoretical physicist at the Joseph Staffan Institute in Slovenia for over 40 years, working on mirror particles, brain spaces, and Clifford algebra and spaces, among other important areas. He's published more than 100 scientific papers and three books, including The Landscape of Theoretical Physics, A Global View, and The Stumbling Blocks Against Unification and of course the biocentrism book that we're going to be discussing today. Now I have only recently come across this idea of life giving rise to space and time but like panpsychism it does seem to explain some of the anomalies that material science is struggling with at the moment so I simply can't wait to speak to one of the theory's developers. So without further ado let's go. Dr. Mate Pausic, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. How are you today? Okay, very well. So, thank you for inviting me to, to say something about this uh, very complicated subject that is a relation between quantum mechanics, consciousness, and Biocentrism. Well, it's a great pleasure to have. Also very important for me to represent international physicists. So thank you so much for making the effort in a, in a difficult language. So thank you, Mate. Mate, I love to start by asking my guests about their first conscious ideas and the big questions that they first started having in their youth, maybe just around, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. Can you remember anything from that time that might have given you an idea that you would have been drawn to theories that gave some special place to consciousness? Oh, yes. Uh, when uh, we are playing as children, I once asked why I am aware of the world around me just from that particular point of view, namely from my body and head. Uh, could I have been aware of the world from, from the other point of view of some other boy or girl that I was playing with? This was just a momentary uh, thought idea. Okay, otherwise I was much interested into the concrete material things I was assembling 
simple radio detectors based on diodes and performing all sorts of experiments and uh, designing various inventions and so on. I was, on the one hand, much influenced by my father, uh, who was a Slovenian poet and writer, so philosophically oriented person, who was much interested into such issues related to physics, the universe in which we live, and so on. Uh, he talked to me a lot uh, about that and even hinted to, to general relativity uh, when he mentioned that uh, our world could be embedded in higher dimension and that we are just like creatures on the surface of an egg. On the other hand, uh, I was much influenced by one of my uncles who was a chemical engineer and uh, who explained to me, among many other things, the basics of special relativity. The other uncle, uh, who was an electrotechnical engineer, explained to me how to build simple electronic devices. So I early decided uh, that I will be a physicist. That's so fantastic, the influence of your uncle and your father, these two different uh, doors to the same deep, deep questions and deep reality. Now, Mate, before we get into your physics research on the biocentrism theory, let's go through the by now well-known anomalies in modern physics that we're struggling to explain in purely material terms without including the presence of consciousness or conscious observers somewhere in that equation. Uh, by the way, listeners, um, all these themes we're about to touch on, the wave-particle duality, quantum entanglement, the uncertainty principle, the non-linearity of time, a, a universe fine-tuned for life, they've all been dis uh, covered in detail on the show. So don't worry if it seems like we're just brushing over these feel free to go back and get the full explanation of these extraordinary phenomena if you want to understand them better. So, Marte, the first, this classic wave-particle duality paradox, which really got the whole story started, didn't it? Interpreted in the early 1900s by theorists like Niels Bohr in a way that became known as the Copenhagen interpretation, that matter behaves like waves or particles depending on whether it's being observed or not and the implication that the world doesn't exist completely independently of the physicist who's observing it. Now, at the time, this was hugely controversial, and it was resisted by many physicists, particularly by Einstein. Um, and because of this probabilistic nature of quantum calculations, Burr made this very famous quote, when we measure something, we are forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We are not measuring the world, we are creating it. Now, can you unpack that for us, Mate, without going into too much uh, of the physics detail and talk about how a change in our perspective of reality towards, for example, biocentrism or panpsychism removes the sort of paradox and the weirdness often associated with this kind of quantum phenomena? Okay, there are many interpretations of uh, quantum mechanics, and there is no consensus about uh, which one is true. Uh, Feynman said, nobody understands quantum mechanics. Uh, okay, and other people say that we are like blind people investigating an elephant. Somebody touches his legs and says, oh, it is like a tree. Another, another one examines its snout and claims, it's a sort of snake, and so on. In fact, all those statements reveal uh, a property of the elephant, and in this sense, they, they are all true. What is lacking is an over, overall view, a crucial insight about what quantum mechanics is actually describing. 
Some people say that wave function, the central mathematical object of quantum mechanics, represents only a former expression of agents' degrees of belief that is their available knowledge about a certain experimental situation. This view about nature of psi implies that the dynamical processes described by the Schrodinger equation, the central mathematical equation of quantum mechanics, provides solely the evolution of the probabilities in the agent's mind. Hence, there is no motion of quantum object in space-time. Uh, to others, uh, this is unacceptable because, as they say, wave function, if it's quantum state, then does not refer to anything real in the world. They insist that quantum mechanics should describe and that it does describe the behavior of objectively existing object moving in real space. Mm. So what does then quantum mechanics describe? Something real or our perceptions? The question here is what is real or even what is really real? <laughs> When we watch a physical object, for instance, a table in front of our eyes, we are aware of its existence through our conscious experience of seeing a table. We interpret this experience as meaning that an actual table exists in the space outside there, independently of us. But if we watch by a suitable instrument an object in the micro world, for instance, an electron, it is not so obvious that we can interpret the situation as if at every moment the electron existed at a certain position in space. The experiments show that the electron exists at many positions at once, and only when we observe it, that is, measure its position, the electron is found at a certain place. Before the measurement, it was not certain at which place it will be found. Only the probability was known. The probability is given by the wave function and is spread over many positions until we perform measurement of position. Then happens the so-called uh, collapse of the wave function into a definite outcome. Uh, this has been and is still very enigmatic. Uh, what does it mean that the electron has no definite position until we measure it? For instance, it may exist as a wave and move, move on until it arrives at a fluorescent screen. If we look at the screen, we find a spot on the screen. This indicates the place where the electron hit the screen. But what if we did not look? Would the electron hit the screen at the position even if we did not look? Uh, because the electron, before coming uh, to the screen, existed as a wave and had thus many positions all at once. 
this means that also when hitting the screen, after hitting the screen, there should be many impact position at once. Hence, there should be a superposition of many screens, each one with a spot uh, at a different place. Now, if my friend Alice looks at the screen, she finds the black spot at a definite position. And if I do not look, there should be many possible positions of the black spot and also many possible versions of Eric, each seeing a different spot, means a different place on the screen. This means that there must be many different works, each one containing a different version of Alice. So you so, are supporting yeah. supporting the many worlds interpretation. <laughs> yeah, just that, yeah. So we arrive at the so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics invented by Hugh Everett in 1957. Uh, this interpretation claims that there is no collapse of the wave function. After a measurement, all different possible outcomes of the measurement still exist and are incorporated in the multi-branched wave function. For instance, each branch containing a different version of Alice. Hence, as far as Alice is concerned, there is no wave function uh, collapse. Instead, there are different versions of Alice. The wave function incorporates Alice entangled with the screen. But this scene with the screen and Alice is being observed by me. The wave function that incorporates the screen, Alice, and Alice is associated with me. My conscious experience, when I look at the screen, I see a definite spot on the screen. And if I ask Alice, she would confirm that she also sees the same spot. Relative to my first person's experience, my consciousness, the wave function after I looked is no longer in superposition. The wave function has collapsed. Relative to somebody else observing the screen, me and Alice, the wave function would be in a superposition until he or she looks at the screen. Hence, as often happens in science, so recall the question of whether the light is wave or particles. Both is true. The wave function in the Everett theory indeed does not collapse as far as other observers like Alice are concerned. Relative to me, the wave function does collapse when I perform a measurement. That is, uh, when I look at the screen, wave function is relative to an observer. Everett quotes his theory, the relative interpretation of quantum mechanics and introduce the concept of relative wave function. He also introduced the concepts of the universal wave function, which he considered as an objective entity, or say, perhaps, uh, but according to, to biocentrism, there is no objectively universal wave function. Every wave function is relative to an observer. 
So that is very, very interesting to me to hear uh, a special place for consciousness being reconciled with the many worlds theory there, the many worlds interpretation. And um, listeners, we are going to be doing a show uh, on the many worlds interpretation, which of course is controversial in physics. But uh, as, as Mate says, there has been no consensus on this yet. It's still very much up for grabs. Um, let's move on, Mate, to quantum entanglement which we talked about listeners in episode four in detail with Dr. Chris Fields. So do go back to that if you want to uh, understand that deeper. We go a lot into, into the implications of entanglement and into John Wheeler and stuff. Einstein famously dismissed the entanglement as spooky action at a distance, but it has since been verified in labs hundreds and hundreds of times. Mate, how would biocentrism account for this phenomena? Yeah, uh, biocentrism, in fact, uses the basic concepts and foundings of quantum mechanics. And one of them is uh, entanglement. Entanglement uh, in biocentrism is related to the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, we observers are, in a sense, uh, all connected. Uh, and uh, they, some people say that. This is uh, related to entanglement. Uh, what uh, I, I would not uh, be able now to uh, elaborate on this in too much uh, detail. Mm. Sorry. Is that because you don't agree? Uh, I agree with entanglement. Mm. Uh, but, but you don't I, agree with the biocentrism accounting in this case? Uh, Perhaps not just in, in this way, but anyway, I would not like to to go into the two muddy waters mm. of of philosophy and meditation and so on, which is somehow connected to the quantum idea of entanglement. People, physicists, will say that what we are talking here is not physical at all, but at least half of physicists, maybe perhaps, still thinks that there is consciousness relation, relation of consciousness with uh, quantum mechanics. I know a number of them, even in modern times. I talk to them, but let us leave this. Uh, okay, we'll let the listeners make their own mind up when they, when they look yeah, at the yeah. book as well. Okay, um, fourthly, I want to look quickly at Einstein's theory of general relativity, which your uncle uh, introduced you to when you were so young. <laughs> Now, I think we are still trying to understand the implications of this. Why is the relativity of space and time so difficult for us to understand from our linear point of view? And can biocentrism help to see it uh, in a more logical way? Yeah. So relativity of time and space is the essence of special and general relativity. So for physicists, is not confounding. Those theories forms a hard core, core of the materialistic science. Time and space form the arena in which, in which lives the so-called block universe, the past, present, and future all exist at, at once. In the relativity theory, there is no subjective experience of becoming the unfolding of events one by one from the past via the present towards the future. The things change with the advent of quantum mechanics. From the biocentric point of view, uh, at least as I see it, Quantum mechanics is not a theory of an objective external world. It is not a mechanics about an objectively existing external observer independent world. Quantum mechanics is a mechanics of consciousness. Consciousness and the world associated with it are inseparable whole. So another point that keeps coming up 
uh, at the moment, particularly relating to the panpsychism question, is that we live in a universe that's fine-tuned for life. Uh, Lancer talks about over 200 parameters in cosmology that are so sensitive uh, to the evolution of life that it seems statistically almost impossible for such conditions to have evolved just by chance. Now, obviously, there is the anthropic principle that says that, well, life has arisen. So, of course, we would say that the universe is fine-tuned for that. And of course, your your many worlds interpretation that says this is just one of an infinite number of universes and, and uh, only in some of those universes are the conditions just right for life. Tell us about this statistical argument for a universe predisposed for life and, and how does it seem so, so unlikely uh, when we switch to a biocentric perspective? Yeah, uh, to answer this question, Question. Uh, I have first to say the following. According to biocentrism, consciousness is fundamental. Without consciousness, there can be no reality. Reality is consciousness, and consciousness is reality. In that sense, an um, ultimate reality is consciousness. The enigma. What, on the one hand, there is me, my first person experience, conscious experience, and on the other hand, there is there are other observers like Alice, uh, who are also conscious, uh, can be explained by introducing the concept of the hierarchical levels of representations. We often say something like this. If I were in your place, I would have done it differently. Or if I lived again, I would have done it differently. The first sentence illustrates that consciousness is localized in one's particular brain, while the second sentence illustrates that consciousness is localized in the space of all possibilities. Within the framework of quantum mechanics, this is the space of all possible quantum states. This space is called Hilbert space, and in this space, wave function, which describes quantum state, and the consciousness associated with it can evolve along many possible paths. But normally, it evolves along just one path. At any moment of its subjectively perceived time, consciousness finds itself localized at or closely around some point along an average branch. Of course, there are other brains and other average branches in which consciousness can also be localized, but these are not the brains and average branches in which my consciousness is localized, but namely, I am not in your place, and in my life, I have experienced just this particular sequence of events and not some other sequence of events. Uh, there is crucial difference, the crucial distinction between one's own consciousness and perception of somebody else consciousness expressed by the sentence, I am not in your place. Everyone experiences his own consciousness, his or her I, as being localized in his or her head and not in someone's else head. By consciousness, we have in mind our own consciousness, 
when we speak about the consciousness of somebody else, we mentally put ourselves in his head, in his place. The so-called heart problem of consciousness arises when we attempt to understand, describe in scientific terms how consciousness arises from the brain's activity. If a scientist, uh, say Bob, inspects the brain activity of somebody else, say Alice, then Alice's brain and his functioning, functioning is in fact represented in, in Bob's brain, that is in Bob's consciousness. From Bob's perspective, everything, including Alice and her brain, is represented in his consciousness. The outside world, including Alice, is like being painted in Bob's consciousness. When inspecting, for instance, by monitoring the functioning of Eddie's brain, Bob tries to figure out how Alice perceives the world, how she is conscious about the world around her. From Bob's perspective, this is just like a picture within a picture or movie within a movie. However, hard Bob tries to understand Alice's consciousness and her perception of the, the outer world, this is just a picture represented, painted in Alice's brain, which in turn is a picture in Bob's consciousness. We see that there are different levels of representation relative to me, from my point of view, on the highest level, there is a representation, a picture of the world as perceived by consciousness. Within such the highest level picture, there are lower level pictures associated with other observers. If we do not take this into account and do not distinguish between different levels of representation, then we have the so-called well-known, notorious, hard problem of consciousness. The problem is in our favor to recognize that lower level of representations of the world, a picture within a third person's brain under our scientific investigation cannot be identified with the higher level of representation associated with the experimental consciousness. And the experimental consciousness is just a representation, a picture in my consciousness. The highest level of representation of the experience world is associated with consciousness. On the other hand, the world is described by the wave function. This means that there is close relationship between consciousness and wave function. The lower representation of the world in another person's brain is not consciousness. And if we wish to understand how consciousness can arise in that person's brain, we have the hard problem of consciousness. Consciousness and the associated wave function are the highest level concepts and cannot be derived from the lower level concepts. Mm. Yeah, but what about solipsism? 
is this solipsism what we are talking about this right now. Solipsism is avoided by postulating that the wave function consciousness can be localized in any brain, either within a particular Everett world or somewhere else in the multiverse of many Everett worlds. Thus, I could have been at the place of another person, namely wave function is a mathematical object whose evolution is determined by its initial value, which can be either such or others. A wave function can be associated with a universe in which the I, me feeling, is in Bob's brain, seeing Alice as a representation, a picture in his brain. Or alternatively, a wave function can be associating with a universe such that the I is in Alice's uh, brain, seeing Bob as a representation, a picture in, in her brain. In other words, the wave function of the universe can be localized in or associated with Bob's brain, or it can be localized in Eddie's brain. Other possible forms of wave function can exist in principle. For instance, a wave function not sharply localized in one's particular brain or within one particular ever branch at all, but being spread over a larger range of branches, of larger range of ever words, of larger ra range of uh, possibilities. Mystical experiences reported by many people uh, can be or could be understood as being associated with such a wave function, with such a quantum state. Now, uh, so a wave function associated with a particular me feeling localized in a particular head is just a possible collapse of an all possibilities embracing wave function. One of the many possibilities is the existence of the universe fine-tuned for life. And of course, the wave function associated with or describing my conscious experience has collapsed into such a, a, a fine-tuned world, world which allows for, for life. So, how to reconcile this with the usual view in physics, according to which uh, the universe started with Big Bang and evolved towards the, the occurrence of life on the Earth. In cosmology, the talk is about a wave function of the universe, which comprises many uh, possibilities many possible histories. According to the famous physicist Hawking and Wheeler, the past is, is, is not fixed. Uh, it resides within the cloud of many possibilities of the wave function. Only when we look, we perform a measurement. One of those possibilities becomes actual for us. Therefore, hints of, of uh, biocentrism are already in Hawking and Wheeler's ideas. Mm. Anyway, uh, we do not know how Big Bang occurred, what triggered it, because we do not have a workable, uh, generally accepted theory of quantum gravity. According to the argumentation expressed in my book, stumbling blocks against unification 
and some preceding scientific papers, Big Bang could be an initial vacuum instability in the quantum field theory that contains positive and negative. Or just a little propaganda for my for my scientific work and the, the book of last <laughs> year. And we <laughs> will be including that book in the show notes. For, okay. For, it's <laughs> definitely <laughs> worth just, it. Just to, to measure real, also, all those speaking about all these uh, weird things about quantum mechanics conscious, my focus on scientific research is along more, so to say, uh, serious lines uh, and uh, one of that is this written uh, recent book and so okay yeah and where where does your research come into this book mate and into biocentrism i mean first of all like how did you get involved in the book and and what's your part in the, the what's actually written in it yeah <laughs> as as a physicist i have been working on various topics of the theoretical physics. And as I mentioned, I published with Kluver Academic, uh, okay, in 2001, I published with Kluver another book, book that I mentioned just right now, another book, The Landscape of Theoretical Physics, a Global View, which in the last non-technical part entitled Beyond the Horizon, contains a discussion about foundational and interpretational issues regarding quantum mechanics and its relation to consciousness. In 2015, I obtained uh, as a present of my wife, a Slovenian translation of the book, Biocentrism. After reading it, I contacted Robert Lanza on his blog. Uh, it was difficult to find his uh, email address and brought uh, to his attention the last chapter of my book. He wrote me back and proposed uh, collaboration. In fact, uh, yeah, I did not elaborate uh, the theory of biocentrism mathematically. Uh, I only elaborated the interpretation of quantum mechanics and Everett theory, so to bring explicitly consciousness into the game. The book was intended for, for the general audience. Uh, therefore, we attempted to hold the discussion at a simple level as possible. So my two complicated texts were simplified by our writer, Bob Berman, and then also further improved by the publisher. A result is that many readers find the book fascinating and comprehensible, but unfortunately, the readers with scientific education are critical and find it too simplistic and contradictory in certain points. So to, to eventually satisfy such readers, a new, more rigorous book would be necessary. Perhaps at the moment, uh, those people should see my original text uh, for the book. Um, I anyway. think we, we will definitely be including uh, a link to that book in the show notes, listeners, and this particularly this last chapter is where you should go if you're looking for a more detailed uh, understanding of how the physics relates to the biocentrism theory because it does sound like, um, you know, lovely Bob Berman, he's a great science communicator and understandably these publishers, they would love to bring this book to the general public but there are definitely and always are in these cases some compromises on how much detail can yes, be gone yes, into. Yes. So um, okay. regarding, regarding the sort of testability of all of this, which obviously most of my listeners, they're always looking for repeatable uh, evidence-based 
studies that can support these kind of theories. Has uh, any of the physics or biology of biocentrism been tested experimentally? I mean, is it even possible to design experiments to test this? Uh, in fact, um, yeah, how, how to say? If you are talking about this last book, by uh, the grand biocentric design, we don't have any, uh, okay, there are many experiments as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. So in this sense, of course, biocentrism uh, has been tested experimentally because the validity of quantum mechanics is ubiquitously experimentally verified. Biocentrism brings the verdness of quantum mechanics into a proper perspective. Quantum mechanics is mysterious and work if one refuses to bring a consciousness into description. Of course, a future developer should incorporate into the theory also the internal subjective experience like qualia, perception of color, redness, and describe them mathematically. But, in, but what we have so far, at the end of the book, Lanza published together with the physicist Dmitry Podolsky and the other two and the other physicists, very famous physicist, Andrei Barvinsky, a technical scientific paper showing that the observer has a crucial role in the history, in the theory of quantum gravity. And that even if one does not accept the strong postulates of biocentrism, that is primacy of consciousness, uh, so no objective external role, etc., the weaker version of, of biocentrism, in which there is there is an external world and the usual view on physics are, are valid is still there. So one can one cannot reconcile quantum mechanics with relativity unless one takes into account the observer. The observer as understood by the vast majority of physicists. So somebody who is performing observations, measuring uh, uh, points of space-time, positions of object, and so on. So this is also a fascinating approach uh, to biocentrism within the framework of the hard physics without deviation into strange waters uh, of consciousness and so on. Yeah. But it's also interesting to hear there uh, that other physicists who don't follow the many worlds interpretation, they're, they're using mm -hmm. different interpretations, that they can still agree that biocentrism helps to explain some of these phenomena. So that's interesting to notice yes, that, yes. that the interpretation yes. of quantum mechanics doesn't necessarily exclude biocentrism, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got to ask about this chapter in the book. There's a chapter called Quantum Suicide and the Impossibility of Being Dead. Now, you must tell us what this playful title is about. I imagine it's been twisted for a dramatic <laughs> effect. What's this chapter about? Yeah, uh, it is about a hypothetical experiment, uh, which is a quantum analog of the Russian roulette. Instead of a classical revolver, a quantum gun is used. Instead of the classical randomness due to only one bullet in the revolver, the quantum randomness is used. The quantum gun is in a superposition of the, of the state of fire and click, that is a state of no fire. In, in click means you, you trigger, but nothing happens. You only hear click. Uh, in this experiment, there are two perspectives. One is that of, um, of a non-involved person 
say Alice, and the other one of the person pressing the gun against his head, say Bob. From the perspective of Alice, Bob will die after several trials. But from the perspective of Bob, the gun will never fire. There, there will always be click. His consciousness will always jump or on the branch or hang up on the branch of the wave function in which he is alive. Consciousness cannot jump into the world branch which does not support consciousness. In, in this example uh, is the world in which Bob's head was hit, uh, hit by, by, by the bullet. This can be generalized to any situation and concluded that from the first person's perspective, there is, there is no death. Consciousness always finds itself somewhere in the Hilbert space of possible worlds. Uh, according to such reasoning, consciousness does not end with that. In the book, The Grand Biocentric Design, we explain in some more detail why from the first, first person point of view, consciousness does not cease to exist. This was uh, also discussed in the last non-technical part of my book, The Landscape of Theoretical Physics, uh, which, as I mentioned, appeared in, in 2000, uh, 2001. Yeah. My goodness, what an extraordinary theoretical expansion of uh, discussions which are happening now in science. Um, we have an episode, listeners, on near-death experience with Dr. Van Limmel. Um, this is uh, really interesting to hear that there could be a quantum physics explanation for how consciousness may survive after death. What an extraordinary possibility and something we're going to be very tentative as we approach, uh, listeners, because we understand it's very controversial and it's tied up with all kinds of religious beliefs. So we need to go very slowly as we approach these themes. Now, Mate, uh, coming back to this deep reality of quantum mechanics and this famous Niels Bohr quote that I mentioned at the start, this simple act of observing forces, um, that, you know, taking them from the interdeterministic, from the prob probabilistic and making them quantifiable by measuring them, by observing them. I mean, Bohr called this the creation of of the world. Is it that extreme? What are the implications from your point of view and uh, the implications for the future of the material sciences and the, and the material physics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, while the founders of quantum mechanics uh, were not hesitant to talk about consciousness, today, considering Consciousness in relation to quantum mechanics is mostly considered as unacceptable. In fact, a sort of pseudoscience. Woo to woo. further woo woo, isn't it? Woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> but it is not first time that history that something was considered as new. Okay. Just readers advised to look into my last book, Stumbling Blocks Against Unification. There are in their description of this. Uh, so, to further proceed, physics should extend its scope to the research of consciousness in relation to quantum mechanics in a thorough way. Without doubt, new breakthrough will appear also on the technological side, as happens so often in history. Okay, well, that sounds uh, positive and hopeful, and that's what we need, isn't it? But I think Lancer mentioned something here. I mean, the quantum theory community has basically escaped from integrating these implications 
into their worldview by, by claiming that there are different laws of physics at the quantum level than at our everyday level. And I, I have trouble swallowing that. Uh, and other many worlders like Sean Carroll have spoken about this, this need to work from the quantum level up. That if the quantum level is the fundamental level, then we need to explain this level in terms of quantum physics. And I just think it's, you know, for example, this upward causation idea, which is, is so often used in the reductionism of material science, that everything is caused by the sum of its smaller parts. I mean, Lancer talks about this surprisingly large quantum measurements. Where exactly is the separation between the the world of quantum where, where the, the laws are so different that we don't need to apply them to our, our everyday world. Where, where is the limit? Because I don't think it's clear. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in, in many world interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, quantum superpositions and entanglement are, are not limited to, to, the micros, to the microscopic case. They occur at a classical level as well. But because the instrument is entangled with the environment, it is not the instrument alone which is in a superposition. It is the instrument together with the environment uh, which is in superposition. Therefore, we do not observe superposition at the macroscopic level. Uh, so there is no separation between the small and the large world. Both worlds are ruled by quantum mechanics. Cleverly designed experiments are showing superpositions and entanglement at larger and larger scales. There seems to be no limit on the size of object to get, that can be put into a controlled, experimentally observed entanglement. Absolutely, Martin. And I think it's so interesting what you said before about perspective. No, that, that really this obviously experimental data is hugely going to help that perspective to open up. But I think it's really most of what is blocking this is really just our ability to see things in a certain way, not the data itself. And um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that as these uh, important experiments testing just how small the quantum world actually <laughs> has to be i'm convinced that this is going to slowly open up the conversation and that the more mainstream physics is going to be forced to change the way they see this question of the observer. Well, Mate, I know we've come to the end of our time, but it remains for me just to thank you very much for making this huge effort to translate your ideas into English for us uh, today and to help us to see that biocentrism, which again seems a crazy idea from our current historical perspective. But as soon as we start to look at the actual data and understand that really it's not the data that needs to change, it is the way we're looking at the data, we start, we start to realize that actually there is a lot going for panpsychism and for, for biocentric approaches. So thank you very much. Listeners, do please go and check out Mate's new book with Robert Lancer if you want more detail because obviously that's been watered down for a, a general public do also go and see the link in the show notes to that final chapter on the importance of consciousness in uh, Mate's other book which we're going to be linking as well thank you so much for being with us Dr. Pasic thank you as well